Well, welcome back to our journey through the book of Ezra. We enter chapter 8. Um, I call this section God's hand for our good. As always, please do take some time to read through the chapter for yourself, just to familiarize yourself with what's going on in this story and look out for important repetition, uh, perhaps even read it in a different translation as well to, to see a different, uh, the ESV is often very helpful just to show you um, words that are repeated in the text. So read it, pray through it, ask God to open your eyes to see wonderful truths as you seek him in his word. And that's ultimately what we are doing. We want to seek to know our God better so that we might love him more and serve him more faithfully and worship him more completely. And this passage will help us to do that. So just take some time to read it and pray through it. And I'm going to highlight a few things that I've noticed in this text. In Ezra chapter 7, it was focused in on Ezra himself. And um, here the spotlight zooms out a bit and we're looking at God's people as a whole. Chapter 7 ended with Ezra saying, Because the hand of the Lord my God was on me, I took courage and gathered leaders from Israel to go up, me, up with me. And in this chapter we are seeing um, that verse expanded. And as we saw in chapter 7, the gracious hand of our God, that's a key theme in this chapter 2. So we see it here, verse 18, because the gracious hand of our God was on us. Verse 22, the gracious hand of our God is on everyone who looks to him. And then verse 31, the hand of our God was on us. So that repetition is important in both chapter 7 and 8. We are seeing God at work. And a real key section in this chapter is verse 21 to 23, where we see the gracious hand is on everyone who looks to him. A better translation there is everyone who seeks. Everyone who seeks God. And that is repeated in verse 21, verse 22, and verse 23, it says, There by the Ahava Canal I proclaimed a fast, so that we might humble ourselves before our God and seek from Him. Seek from Him a safe journey, everyone who seeks Him. And then so we fastened, uh, fasted and petitioned. Again, it's the same Hebrew word, so we sought. We sought our God. And that is what we see God's people doing in this section. They are seeking God. Now, very importantly, this isn't like hide and seek. God is not hidden from them. This is the God they know, but they are seeking to know him more so that they might live his way and love him more and worship him more fully. And that's what we see happening in this chapter. And as Ezra himself has been seeking the Lord, in chapter 7, he was set up much like a leader like Moses. And here he sets up this return to look like the return from the Exodus. And so we meet uh, Phineas and Ithamar, in, or the, the descendants of Phineas and Ithamar in this section. Um, Phineas and Ithamar were priests. Uh, they are descendants of Aaron. And so the priests are there and we'll see the priests are important throughout this whole section. So the priests are there. Now they are heading back to the house of God, the temple. And the priest's job within the house of God was to make sacrifice for the sins of the people. And so ultimately that's one of the key reasons they are going back. They want to go back to the house of God with the priests so that they might sacrifice for their sins. That's this God who they are seeking. They want their relationship with him restored. And throughout the section we'll see them speaking of um, God as our God. He is the God they know. So they're not seeking a God who's hiding. 
He's a God who has revealed himself to them. Ezra told us in chapter 7 that he had set his heart on learning uh, about this God and doing what he says and teaching others to do the same. And here we see a people who are seeking God. They are seeking the Lord. So as they are seeking God, they know that the gracious hand of their God is on them. Um, another translation of this is, The hand of our God was on us for our good as we sought him. God's hand for our good is, is what we're seeing in this passage. So Ezra sets up this uh, return to look like the Exodus. We've got the priests who are a key part of that. And then from verse 3 onwards, we have 12 groupings. So these 12 groupings, so it's a symbolic representation of the 12 tribes of Israel. Just like in the first Exodus, Israel is following that pattern. But before they actually set out on the journey, they stop at the canal, the canal that flows from Ahava, the Ahava Canal. And as they stopped there, they realized there's a problem. When I checked among them, I found no Levites. Now, the Levites were also descendants of Aaron. Um, I mean, descendants of Levi. As Aaron was, all of the descendants of Aaron become the priests. But all the other Levites who aren't descended of Aaron, they aren't priests, they become the Levites. And their job was to help. In the first exodus, they were the ones who carried all of the, the sacred articles uh, for the tabernacle. But here he finds that there are no Levites. So before they can leave, he wants to make sure that they can gather a few Levites. We see again, because the gracious hand of our God is on us, he brought us Sherebiah, who is a son of Levi, one of the sons of Israel and Hashabiah. So some Levites join. We see here Hashabiah and Sherebiah and their ten brothers. Um, just helpfully to see here, uh, I think a more accurate translation here, you'll see many other translations will say and rather than namely because we've already been told that Sherebiah and Hashabiah aren't priests. So it's not namely them, it's and them. The priests are there and the Levites. Sherebiah, Hashabiah, and their ten brothers. So we see the Levites. So now this returning group has priests. Israel symbolically represented in these twelve groupings. The Levites are now with them. And at the heart of this section, we see um, they seeking a safe journey for their, for them and their children and their possessions. In verse 26, or 26 and 27, we see this massive um, treasure that they are taking with them. Uh, in South African rand terms, this is about 3 billion rand. It is a huge treasure that they are carrying. It's even more than that, that they are carrying back with them. So a great treasure, and so they are seeking God's safety for both them and this, these possessions that the Levites are now carrying. So you can see the need for the Levites. There was a massive amount that the Levites needed to carry for them. And we see that they're praying. That the, He had told the king, King Artaxerxes, he said, The gracious hand of our God is on everyone who seeks him. And so they are fasting and seeking their God. And we're told before the story goes on that our prayer was answered. So this in many ways is the climax of the story. Um, we, we know that this prayer is answered. So we know that they get back safely. And the rest tells us about how that journey continues. So all of these possessions, we're told in this section that they are weighed out. And that is repeated and we're waiting until it will be weighed out in the house of the Lord in Jerusalem. 
And then when we get to verse 33 onwards, we're told that they weighed it out. So God kept secure all of these possessions that they had petitioned their God for. They had sought safe journey for themselves and their goods. So the goods make it there safely. We know that they are heading for Jerusalem. We see Jerusalem repeated a number of times here too. But ultimately, it's much more than just Jerusalem. They are heading to the house of God in Jerusalem because they want the priests to make sacrifice for their sins. As they are seeking God, they want their relationship with God restored. And so they're going back to the house of God to make sacrifice. So in verse 22, we saw the king had said, uh, or had... They had not asked the king to protect them along the way. Um, here we see God protected them. They didn't need the king's protection. They knew that the hand of their God was on them as they were seeking him. And so we see God protected them. God got them home. So they are safe. Their possessions are secure. And then in these verses, we see they are sacrificing. Uh, 12 bulls for all Israel, 12 male goats as a sin offering. They know that their sin is a problem and they are seeking God. They are seeking to have their relationship with God restored. And so they sacrifice these 12 goats as a sin offering for all Israel. So all Israel is another re repeated phrase in this section family heads of Israel. We see that they are symbolically represented here. So we've got this people, Ezra is leading them, but together they are a people who are everyone who is seeking the Lord. And they know that his gracious hand is on them. Now, as we work our way through a passage like this, it should grow in us an uneasiness uh, because we know that we ourselves don't always seek the Lord. Um, so how can we have this assurance that his gracious hand will be on us? One great gospel link that we can go to in this story would be uh, Luke 19. There's lots that you could go to, but Luke 19 verse 1 to 10 tells us the story of Zacchaeus. And what we see in the story of Zacchaeus is not Zacchaeus seeking the Lord. We see Jesus seeking Zacchaeus. And in verse 10 specifically, he says that the Son of Man came to seek and save. You see, Jesus came to seek and save us because in and of ourselves, we don't seek the Lord. As Romans 3 tells us that there's no one righteous. There's no one who seeks the Lord. But God, in his grace, came in the person of Jesus to seek and save us. And for those who have been saved by him, we can know for sure that the gracious hand of our God is on us because of Jesus. And because of him, we want to continue to seek him. Not trying to find him, he's found us. But as we now seek him, we want our relationship with him to be deepened. We don't need to go to Jerusalem and make sacrifice because he came to seek and save us. The final sacrifice has been made. So we seek to grow, to know him better, that we might live for him more fully and worship him more completely. And so a chapter like this should amaze us as we see this people seeking him. It should stir us to want to seek the Lord. But it should ultimately thrill our hearts because we know that Jesus came to seek us and to save us so that we might be him, his. And so we know for sure that God's hand is on us for our good. As Paul says in Romans 8, for we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him. He came to seek us, to show us his love. We can know that his hand is on us for our good. So as you dig in further and teach this to others, I pray that you will rejoice in these truths. Well, God bless as you dig in further.